The first episodes of this series have been about big men, because the game was built for their dominance back then. Less spacing and no three-pointer placed a premium on rim protection and on interior scoring. There were a few non-bigs who could hang with the Giants. Julius Irving's aerial wizardry earned him the MVP in 1981, and Oscar Robertson won the award in 1964 as a 6'5 guard. But Larry Bird was like none of these players. He was something entirely unique that the basketball world had never seen before and hasn't seen since. You are watching what greatness is all about. Where's Larry Bird in all this? Has it blocked by Elijah Wong? Michael Jordan <laughs> saves the day. This series tackles one question. Who was the best at his best? We start at the ABA merger and go through the best multi-year stretches, examining the legends who provided the most on-court impact. These are the greatest peaks. Seven minutes left. Larry Bird follows his own shot. Oh, what a point! Bird burst onto the scene in the 80s with his own brand of basketball alchemy. At 6'9", he could play in the post, but was also a world-class outside shooter who could pass. Let's start with the most basic part of this equation, his post-game. Bird's most traditional back-to-the-basket move was a lefty hook. He loved physicality, note the little hip check to claim space, and he could roll this over most defenders. If it wasn't available, he'd start head-faking opponents into some wild finishes, and Larry would throw combinations, feigning right, then to the middle, only to step through, and then what is that reverse off the window? This fakes like a jab that softens his man, and then this crazy rainbow from two feet. And he was constantly manipulating defenders with the ball like this to open up tiny nooks he could work with. At times, it felt hypnotic, like Charles Xavier whispering in defenders' heads. Oh, Where are you going? This is choreographed embarrassment because Bird had the league shook with his shooting and they were on high alert because he could rock you in your face with this quick fadeaway. This was Larry's moneymaker in these spots and like most of his game, it was quick hitting, catching defenders off guard by flowing right into the release. He's already started the move here before catching it and Bird even turned that fadeaway into the OG step back at times. Kiki Vandeweghe is often credited with popularizing the move with this little two-step, but Bird was the first star to unleash it regularly, and certainly with sharper footwork than Kiki. It served Larry well because defenders respected his fakes and he was comfortable falling away. You'll notice that a bunch of these are long twos. Bird's first coach, Bill Fitch, discouraged three-pointers, and it wasn't until about 1985 that Larry started launching more than one per game. Bird was pretty much the best all-around shooter of that era, sprinkling in a variety of outside jumpers, and no one could match his 90% free throw shooting and 40% three-point shooting. Although his volume from deep was low, Steph Curry takes more threes in a typical season than Bird did from 1984 to 1987 combined, and so it's not totally clear how much long ball Larry left on the scoreboard. From 85 to 87, Larry was far more effective from downtown versus weaker defenses, probably because they left him open in these spots, more like he was just a normal player. Against defenses at least two points worse than league average, Bird shot 47% on three attempts every 36 minutes, but against defenses two points ahead of league average, he shot only 34% with a hefty dip in volume. Some of this is likely noise, but his attempts also dropped in the playoffs during his peak years, so I'm not sure how comfortable he was just manufacturing threes. Despite mangling his finger in a college softball game, he had good touch on all kinds of little floaters and flips headed to the hoop. He did this with both hands, regularly making horse shots like this, and he was dexterous enough to make all kinds of off-balance leaners too. But these shots were born out of necessity. Remember that rainbow from two feet earlier? It's because Bird has no explosion at the rim. He often uses his body as a shield to find a cleaner release, even left-handed. And these contortions were to make up for a lack of verticality. Bird actually missed a ton of layups. Oh, it's Walton. 
Uh, where was I? Yes, the, the Miss Bunnies. He often took one dribble in these spots instead of getting all the way to the rim for a loaded up contest. Because even at 6'9", he was at a disadvantage against bigs ready to jump. You may know that legendary game in Portland where he played left-handed. This is mostly a tall tale because he regularly needed his left hand to finish. Here in the post, he's going southpaw for a cleaner look because he's carved out space to his left and can't explode at the rim or leap over defenders. This rim finishing is Bird's real glaring wart as a scorer, and his inability to finish into or through size and contact was a reason why his free throw rate was never great. The upfake frees him, but even against mediocre rim protection, he avoids contact to find a layup. Here he spins clear, but resorts to a floater from point-blank range. At his apex, Bird was a huge regular season score, 28 points per 75, on true shooting percentage 7% ahead of the league. But his best three-year stretch as a playoff scorer from 1984 to 1986 was closer to 24 points per 75 on plus 5% efficiency. We see a similar story in the regular season against stronger defenses, using those splits from earlier. His scoring dipped from nearly 27 points per 75 down to under 23 with a drop in efficiency. This is still good production, but the drop-off is on the larger side for high-end scorers, and I think it speaks to Bird's inability to generate easy shots against stronger defenses. What those numbers don't capture is his scoring flexibility, constantly moving without the basketball. Look at all these tricks to shed Bobby Jones, an all-time defender, and these cuts force attention that opens a post up on one block and on the other, and the move is quick, and that's classic bird. His shooting means you have to chase him, and his post game leads to denials, but then he counter cuts, and that is a slick finish. Bird was an expert at finding little cracks in the defense like this, not at layups. And you can see this perfectly in transition here. Bird likes to float to the wing for three, but as the ball turns the corner, Bird knows that brings help and basket cuts right behind it. And of course he makes that nonsense. He relentlessly pursued advantages. D did you catch it? The ball is reversed, so he swings his leg across his defender to seal and go. A good passer hits him for a layup there, but that's okay because the attention allows a clear iso touch for Robert Parrish. Bird's off-ball game lets him fit next to other great scorers who need the rock, like Kevin McHale, but it also helps him mesh with good passers who learn to see what Bird sees. Larry slows down here to keep his man outside of an empty paint, and Dennis Johnson turns that into a bunny. They had this read down, and it's possible because all these defenders are worried about Bird curling up for an open shot. This made helping off Bird difficult, and he parlayed that activity into fantastic offensive rebounding, rooting inside players when they were on the wrong side of him. He anticipated shots and would sneak into position, look at that work to get inside someone else's man, and he was more comfortable finishing these after sealing off opponents. But for all of his movement and absurd shot making, there was another ingredient to Larry Bird's alchemy that transformed him into an offensive legend. It's one thing to fly off screens as a threat to shoot, but Bird supercharged his value by seamlessly audibling those two passes. He may have been the best passer on the move in NBA history, and that meant scoring routes turned into layups for teammates. Larry blurred shots into passes and punished defensive reactions to his movement like this. And he never stopped the ball. Even on a simple extra pass like this, he adds the screen because he's a step ahead. There's so much anticipation to his game. This is like a touch entry pass, already knowing Robert Parrish's right hand is the soft spot in the defense. Of course, that made him a touch pass master, and this means you have to know where pieces are before the ball arrives. He knows Parrish is the mark the whole way down the court. Obviously, this vision made Bird deadly in transition before defenses were set. Too good, says Don Nelson. Any teammates willing to run with Bird benefited from his attention, and the delivery on some of these passes would make UPS jealous. 
This clip's blurry, but you can still see the whole package, patiently waiting for a cutter to fill the lane, holding the defense by looking away, then snapping a strike to the streaking Walton. We've discussed Bird's manipulation of defenders with the ball, but his go-to trick was the shot pass, where he drew coverage and created better passing angles. Pick and roll wasn't a big part of his game then, but he ran it more in 86 and 87, and that ball fake was so good it distracted McHale too. In the half court, Larry's on-ball passing typically stemmed from his back-to-the-basket game. He welcomed double teams in these spots and could skip it over defensive rotations, or he would just gut teams who weren't disciplined about doubling off cutters. When he had a step, he could make tight laydown passes with the best of them, drawing defenders in for a shot pass and knowing where his teammate would be. Bird wasn't a perfect passer. Besides some limitations off the bounce, he could be a bit out of sync on his entry passes at times. Like many greats, he took all kinds of chances and was too aggressive on some of them. And every once in a while, he'd miss an advanced layup pass. He probably had Danny Ainge there, and coming down on this fast break, the first look is open, but of course Bird is so good, he sends it home anyway. Finally, the man was the best outlet passer I've ever seen. These weren't simply about starting fast breaks. They spawned layups out of thin air. Bird was always thinking about the next possession as the ball went through the net and how to exploit a defense's backline. Ainge is closing to the corner here, and Bird still thinks to instantly look for him on a fly pattern after this make. That's just absurd. All of this made him the second best playmaker of the 1980s. We'll get to the best of the next episode. Making life easier for his teammates in a variety of ways. He even turned loose balls into easy points, ready to drop dimes from his back when he dove on the floor. And all of this helped drive Boston's offense to elite heights. From 1984 to 88, the Celtics' efficiency was 5 points per 100 better than league average, one of the 10 best stretches ever. So, despite Bird's postseason scoring hiccups, Boston's playoff offenses were quite similar, 11th best among teams with stretches like this. Even with Kevin McHale out for over 30 games from 1986 to 88, Boston's offense was six points ahead of the league, behind Bird and company, evidence of his colossal impact. His constant movement and high motor translated to the defensive end, too. After hopping around here until he found open pasture, Bird hightails it back to prevent a fast break, and Larry's defensive preference during the peak of his career was helping off his man in the paint to plug gaps or double-team when needed. That court vision served him well in this role. He's rotating the second his guard gets a step, and Bird's wild jab alters it just enough. His lack of lift made these help attempts only marginally effective. He often rotated in time, but he wasn't springy enough to really swallow up shots. But basketball is a game of percentages, and Bird's constant presence was just enough to turn layups into misses at times, and sometimes these reactions helped make plays a touch easier for his teammates. Larry was just there constantly, and at 6'9", was large enough in spots to protect the rim fairly well for a forward. He had a small block radius and would offer little resistance if caught flat-footed, but Bird also made a surprising number of stands at the hoop, here stonewalling a young Michael Jordan just like an above-average big would. Only, Bird played small forward in a lot of these lineups, so his paint presence became a solid positive next to two other bigs. His incredible hand-eye coordination allowed him to target blocks as the ball was released, and he averaged about a block per game during these peak seasons. He also augmented his rim protection by taking charges before it was in vogue, and his early positioning and out-guessing games forced turnovers on drives like this. Now. Bird has been historically panned for his man defense, but I actually don't think it was too damaging. He was a touch too eager at times and could succumb to up fakes, but against most big forwards of that day, he held his own. On the outside, Bird's slow foot speed was a bit of an issue against slashers, but basketball was played inside 18 feet back then, so even with those clunky steps, teams couldn't really punish him. 
This was a fairly typical man possession for him, overplaying the drive and throwing up a decent contest. Although, just like in the post, he could get into hot water biting on upfakes in these spots. Here's Larry using mind games against a dangerous guard, jabbing toward the ball and then playing the drive left, and his reflexes were insane. His hands are down when this pass is thrown. And those reflexes made Bird a playmaker around the ball, making little kickout passes difficult like a hockey goalie deflecting pucks out of the air. He also turned basic entry passes into an adventure at times with what looked like a sort of basketball spidey sense. Those hands were strong and quick with NASA-like precision, and if you blinked, you'd miss their magic at times. And this phenomenal coordination made that low block tactic possible, and it also made his post doubles really effective, ambushing unsuspecting big men. Here's a possession roaming off his mark on the perimeter, trying to disrupt action, and then bouncing around the edge of the paint, plugging gaps. Here it's this cutter because the spot up three wasn't a threat then. And of course those hands made the double team effective. There's a cat and mouse quality to some of his possessions where he's hoping to induce a mistake instead of just playing it straight up. So Bird's tailor made for zoning up two players like this where he can read a passer's eyes, and it all makes sense that the most memorable play of his career is a steal. Bird's eyeing this pass before Isaiah Thomas had the ball. Isaiah has said he never even saw Larry here. And then, of course, a layup pass with three seconds left. And Big Red cannot believe what he just saw. Most of Bird's defensive tricks weren't big gambles, but sometimes he did whiff. So there was a minor tax to pay for his level of aggression. But Larry rarely made errors or missed key rotations. He'd usually pounce in help situations like this. And overall, I think it's easy to see why he made consecutive all defensive teams from 1982 to 1984. This value bubbles up when we look at Bird's handful of missed games in 1987 and 1988. The Celtics were only a point per game better than their opponents without Bird, or roughly a 45 win pace. But with him, they were plus seven, or a 61 win pace. The changes in 1989 when Larry missed the entire season were nearly identical. Perhaps more notable is what happened when McHale missed large chunks of time. The Celtics were a 64 win team with Kevin and without him they played at a 57 win pace in 31 games. That means that Boston was still a borderline championship team without McHale yet maxed out as an all-time team at 67 wins because Bird could fit next to a star who ostensibly played his own position. That's incredibly impressive to me, and evidence that he's one of the most scalable players ever, able to fit next to a variety of high-end talent. Our historical all-in-one metrics are quite high on his peak, especially this version of Box Plus Minus that's more sensitive to his playmaking impact. We should also note that some of his value comes from strong defensive rebounding, and he was always looking to throw a body on someone or fight for the ball in tough spots. Although this style did take a toll, and playing too many minutes meant he always risked wearing down during deep playoff runs. Larry's body did ultimately break down at 31, but before then, he reimagined what basketball could be. There still hasn't been anyone like him since. And while his defense wasn't always pretty, activity and anticipation made it fairly effective for his time. Sure, slightly better scoring would have put him in his own class on offense, but even without that, Larry Bird is one of the five greatest offensive players of all time. For more historical content and to support this channel, head over to patreon.com slash thinkingbasketball and check out Thinking Basketball the book on Amazon. That goes deeper on a number of ideas explored in this series. There are also longer discussions on many of these players on the Thinking Basketball podcast. And if you're curious about stats from this video, there's an entire stat series on this channel. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this one and that wherever you are, you're having a great day.